In this lecture, we're going to be talking about a few new sounds to English speakers here and how they're created using different combinations of air streams. Right, so today we are getting out of some of the more familiar English sounds and we're starting to talk about sounds that you find here in this non-pulmonic area. Right, and to review, there are two different directions that air can go when you are talking about air going in or out of the lungs. Basically, it can go in, and that's called in fancy terms ingressive. You can inhale, or you can exhale, and that is egressive. So when we're talking, the air can go in or it can go out, and those are the basic two air streams. And we can manipulate that air at different points to create different sounds, All right? And we can call those sort of sources of the sounds or initiators of the sounds. For the most part, we've been talking about pulmonic sounds, those that come out from our, we're talking on an exhale, the air is coming from the lungs, and most of the time it gets set into vibration by the vocal folds. All right, so that's one possible source or initiator of sound. But we can also have things start at the level of the glottis, or right there in the larynx, and those are called glottalic sounds and we'll get into those in more depth. And finally, we can create sounds just out of uh, an air pocket in our mouth, and those are called velaric, because the air that creates those sounds is sort of held in a pocket on top of your tongue, and that's what you do when you make that kind of um, clicking sound, sort of that sound that you might use with your animals, um, or if you're sort of saying, come over here, horse, that kind of sound. All right, when you combine those possibilities, the direction of the airflow, in or out, ingressive, egressive, and those different sources or initiators, the pulmonic, the glottalic, and the valeric, you get these different possibilities. So for the most part, we've been talking about most speech sounds right here that are uh, from air from the lungs that is going out. So all you have to do is see where these different possibilities intersect and you'll see how they're created. So most speech sounds across all languages actually are pulmonic egressive. All right, but we can also talk on an inhale, although it's tricky, it sounds weird, and we can't do it for very long. And sometimes people call that disguised speech because you don't sound like yourself. Like, if I talk on an inhale, that's what I sound like. It doesn't sound like my normal voice. It sounds awful. All right, so that would be the pulmonic ingressive. So we can disguise our voice that way, or we can do it while we're counting to ourselves or uh, when we just want to sound silly. All right, other possibilities are these sounds here called ejectives. Those are glottalic aggressive. Here are implosives, and you'll notice that intersects with the glottalic ingressive. And then there's this big category here called clicks, and those are velaric ingressive. You can also make reverse clicks, but hardly anyone does that, and you have to be really talented, more talented than even I am with my mouth. There aren't too many people who can do a reverse click. All right, but we'll go over each of these in more detail. All right, and you can go over, you'll notice in your notes you have more detail here, but I'm gonna skip ahead to the diagrams um, just during this video lecture. But I've written, left the written out form just in case you wanna read more uh, because this is typically hard to get your mind around, at least at first. Um, so when you talk about uh, pulmonic sounds, or normal speech sounds, uh, at least at some point, 
you're going to have some sort of hypothetical situation where there's equal air pressure, let's say, within the lungs and then above the level of the larynx. Right? As we inhale and exhale, we're constantly taking in more air and increasing the air pressure in our lungs. And then as we exhale, we're letting that air out and reducing the air pressure. So all of these things are constantly changing, but you can have one point of theoretical equilibrium. Uh, what happens when we start to speak, though, is we've had, um, you know, as much of an inhale as we need, so we're going to talk on an exhale. And before we start speaking, we have sort of this high pressure built up in the lungs. And where there is high air pressure, the air always wants to move from an area of high to lower pressure. It wants to get out of that crowded, you know, all those air molecules bumping into each other. And up here above this little wavy line represent your vocal folds. Up here, the air pressure isn't as high. All right, so air starts moving down from the lungs out to an area of lower pressure, even if it is still relatively high. All right, and that ends up with the air escaping more forcefully, although we can adjust that a little bit with our lungs and let it kind of slow down so we don't run out of the air we're speaking on all at once. And oftentimes we have our vocal folds vibrating through that entire period. That is our normal pulmonic speech or the pulmonic aggressive airstream. And all languages have these kinds of speech sounds, even if they have some of the more exotic type or exotic to our ears, at least, that we're going to talk about. So this type of speech sound is in every language, not rare at all. All right, and, oh, sorry, I installed the font. Forgive these little silly symbols down here. Um, hopefully they'll download correctly for you, or I'll give you a, um, a PDF version. Uh, but whenever we inhale, and speak on an inhale, that's called that pulmonic ingressive. All right, so what is supposed to be down here is when you sometimes people alternate when they're counting to themselves. So if you said one, two, and you inhale on that two, that's what that downward arrow represents. And you'll notice um, that the downward arrow is represented here as a down step, all right? So this is slightly different, but uh, when we get to the voice quality IPA chart, you'll see a different little downward arrow that can be used to represent that different airstream, that ingressive airstream. So don't think that that means down step right here, not here, it doesn't particularly. So if we start one, two, three, four, Sometimes people do that, or you'll hear little kids counting to themselves that way. But, you know, you don't get the pulmonic ingressive too often, and there's no language known of that uses that as a phoneme. They don't use this type of sound to make uh, a meaningful difference. So we can't say that the way I said three there is any different than when I say three. It just sounds funny if I say it on an ingressive airflow. All right, but one uh, type of speech sound you can do when you combine an egressive, so the air is going out of the body, uh, but it's also from a glottalic source, so somewhere there in the larynx, is something known as an ejective. Right? And that to us is going to sound a little bit unusual because we don't use these normally in English. Uh, the time where these sounds might be heard are sometimes in people who are profoundly deaf and aren't getting auditory feedback, and sometimes they produce consonants in these waves because they're not hearing that they're stops or fricatives are being produced a little bit different than everyone else around them. Uh, but if you're curious, you can find these sounds in some of these languages, Georgian, Gujarati, Korean, Zulu, um, some Native American languages. 
very end, how a um, glottalic aggressive or an ejective is produced is that um, the sound sort of builds up in the larynx. This is where it comes from. Pressure builds up and is released from that source. Right, so it's not just the normal act of breathing in or out. What happens is the glottis, if you take this line here to represent the vocal folds, it gets shut tight, but the vocal folds aren't really vibrating at this point. And the whole larynx gets jerked upwards. So if you try and swallow, you should feel your larynx get pulled upwards. And those muscles that we talked about briefly before, uh, the extrinsic muscles, there's a set that can pull the larynx upward. And we do that voluntarily when we swallow, but people who can produce these speech sounds can also do that. So we start out with, uh, you know, relatively normal pressure above and below the vocal folds, but when they are pulled upwards, then we create this area right above the vocal folds because we've made that space smaller. We've created an area of high pressure. And like we said before, when high pressure builds up, uh, then that pressure wants to go somewhere, All right? So there's gonna be some other type of um, closure somewhere else in the vocal tract, All right, like the lips or the tongue might be behind the teeth and that will get released. And then all that air that's built up here, this high pressure, is just going to go shooting out all right, at the very end because that high pressure wants to go back to equilibrium. All right, and I have a few examples of those types of sounds for you all. All right, here's one where it should be. Oops, I talked over it. Fairly easy to hear. All right, now this word is going to sound a little bit like k-bop, but you'll hear that k, k, k sound. Does not sound like the way we say that k sound. Listen again to that very first sound. K-bop. All right, a little bit different because that is produced as an adjective. The tongue is still hitting the same place as we would for our k, k sound. Uh, but that larynx is pulled up and you've got that extra air uh, pressure above the vocal folds and then the air shoots out from once that tongue is released. And that's how that different sounding K sound is produced. All right, uh, if you want another view of how that type of sound that ejective is produced, and here's the IPA symbol, a K with a little apostrophe after it. Here's another visual to see how that is produced. You're gonna have the back of the tongue forming a closure, just like you would with your own K. But the difference is the glottis is going to be closed, so the vocal folds are held tightly together. The whole larynx is raised, you get this body of air here in the pharynx that gets compressed or high, has a high pressure. And then when all this is released, the air will come rushing out as that ejected. All right, our next sound, I'll go here so you can see the name. The next one we're going to talk about is an implosive, right? And that's that same, it's a name for something that is produced as a glottalic ingressive. So you know it has something to do with the larynx by the name and that the airflow is going in, All right? So implosives are formed when the larynx is jerked downward. Now this is in... Uh, contrast to the other sound we talked about. We talked about the larynx moving upward. In this case, it's going downward. We can use those same extrinsic laryngeal muscles, but they can also go down. It's a little bit less natural uh, movement for you to make than a swallow, where you normally go up. 
it's harder for us to consciously move our larynx down unless you're used to producing this kind of um, speech sound. All right, but the, the larynx might start out here with um, possibly vibrating vocal folds, or at least they're not very tightly shut. And theoretically, you could say the air pressure above and below the vocal folds is about the same. But if you move those vocal folds downward, then you get an area of high pressure below them because you've made a smaller space and pressure increases with a smaller space. Right, but because the vocal folds aren't tightly shut in this case, the air is going to easily escape through them and head toward this area of lower air pressure and set those vocal folds into vibration. All right, and for an example of how that sounds, actually I'm going to leave this one. We have this example I wanted to play for you. It's going to be fairly easy for you to hear what an implosive sounds like. It's going to be in the middle of this word. So if I were to say it just with plain old pulmonic aggressive consonants, I would say bagod. Bagod. All right, you hear the difference there in that middle sound? That G sounded a little different. Bagod. All right, and now I'm going to play you another one where it's at the beginning of the word. Okay, so I added in, there's an implosive there at the beginning, but there's something else you might have noticed when you heard that. It sounds a little different, that, that sort of clicky sound there. But for now, focus on the beginning. There's something that sounds almost like a buh, but not quite. Uh. All right, that was another implosive. Produced exactly, went too far here, like this little diagram here. All right, this shows you um, a schematic of how an implosive, this particular one, is for a B sound, but produced with a glottalic aggressive air mechanism. And the symbol for that looks like a little B with sort of a little curly tail on top in IPA. All right, so you have lips being closed just like you would with a buh, the way you would normally produce a, a buh with a, a pulmonic aggressive. And you're not going to have much going on here, but when you look down at the larynx, you have to have that downward movement that produces that higher area of air pressure below the vocal folds, which then leaks up. And once that those lips are released, then you have that buh sound. All right, so the next sound we're going to talk about are clicks. And the airstream mechanism for that is the valeric ingressive. Right, and before we talk about how that exactly is produced, they're found in languages spoken in Africa. Sometimes people call them click languages. Uh, but the technical term for that language family is Khoisan. Um, and oftentimes you can recognize a click language because they tend to um, try and represent the name if it has a click in it, often with an exclamation point. So this U or Osa is our names of click languages. And clicks are produced because you need some sort of, they're called valeric, because what they have in common, there's a variety of click sounds you can produce, but the back of the tongue is up against the velum. And there's some other closure somewhere else in the oral cavity. It might be the lips. It might be near the teeth. Uh, it could be different places. But what you're always going to have is some little pocket of air trapped over the, the tongue here. So you're going to have like the tongue tip somewhere or some other closure, a pocket of air, and then the back 
or if we want to use our technical or anatomy terms, the uh, dorsum of the tongue is going to be up against the velum. Right? So what happens then is the tongue is lowered slightly, which creates a larger area here, and that lowers the air pressure. The fancy term that you'll see on your slide is rarefied. All right, that just simply means lower air pressure. There's more space, the air spreads out more, lower air pressure. And once that happens, and this other closure up here towards the front, where you've got the tongue tip maybe on the alveolar ridge here or wherever that might be for your particular click sound, once that's released, then you get air rushing in because air always wants to go from areas of high pressure. We're assuming here that it's higher outside than it is here where it's being held in the tongue. So that air will rush in and that makes that click sound. All right, so if a picture of actual anatomy works better for you, Here's one of what we call a dental or alveolar click. All right, that place of the tongue here is a little imprecise, so I think it can represent either of those. Either the tongue can be um, touching the teeth here. It's a little bit more, looks like it's a little bit more in the back of the teeth, an alveolar click. Uh, but for most of us who don't speak click languages, it's going to be hard to hear the difference between this anyways whether the tongue is touching the back of the front teeth or it's touching the alveolar ridge. All right, but what's going to happen is that back of the tongue is going to form a velar closure here. You're going to have that uh, dorsum there meeting the velum, and you have a area of closure up here in the front of the mouth, in this case the tongue tip. And you have a pocket of air here trapped between those two points. The tongue moves downwards, you get a decreased air pressure there, sort of like this negative air pressure. And once this tongue tip is released, then air is going to rush into the mouth. All right, so maybe if you can make click sounds, you can try this one yourself. That's what it's going to sound like. Or you can listen to my examples here. I have two different examples for you. All right, so in this one, the click sound is going to be towards the beginning of the word. Oko. Oko. Okay. And in the second one, you're going to hear first an adjective as the first sound. And then you're going to hear a click towards the end. Okay. All right, so first, the first sound, that was actually supposed to be an adjective. And then the click. Okay. Sometimes they can sound very similar. All right, all of these different sounds I've played for you are in your um, slides as extra notes, and they're taken from this web page. I suggest it can be hard to hear over recording like this. Uh, seeking out these sounds, I'll also add these links in your um, Blackboard module about this lesson. Go through and you can click on each of these words and listen to them. And match them up with the symbols that you see here in the non pulmonic section of the IPA chart. It's all clearly labeled so you'll know if you're looking at a click, an implosive, or an adjective. Right, and try listening to each one, uh, sometimes even with headphones, to hear really hear the differences. It's easier to hear on your own what exactly is going on. All right, and for our last type of a little bit different kind of speech sound. We're going to talk about esophageal speech. Yeah, All right, so um, there's the one I wanted. I have a little sample here I'm going to bring up on Taylor. 
on YouTube, but first let me show you a diagram. It's a little bit hard to explain what esophageal speech is if you're not familiar with what a laryngectomy does. So first I'm going to cover that. Now if you have some sort of cancer in the larynx and it's so life-threatening that all of your structures have to be removed, like the vocal folds, the cartilages of the larynx, all that stuff we talked about that helps with voice and eating. Uh, but, you know, the cancer is so widespread throughout there that it all has to be removed or you might die of the cancer. Uh, you know, the, the doctors are going to be able to do that. Uh, but it's going to change the way you eat and breathe and you will not be able to speak the way you did before. Right? And that is called a laryngectomy. Right, so rather than having the larynx here that kind of hooks up this connection here with the mouth and where you can go one step through the larynx to the trachea or option number two down to the esophagus for food, instead that's all gone. And what happens without the larynx there is that the trachea is connected up to the neck and you have a hole here in the neck and that's what you breathe in and out of. And that's just a, a permanent change. There's no going back after that. You'll be able to eat normally. So all the food will go in and down to your esophagus. Uh, but you're going to breathe in and out through this hole in your neck, not through your nose anymore. And there's nothing, there's no vocal folds to vibrate. Um, so there's a few different options available for speech, but we're just going to talk about esophageal speech. And what that is, is you're going to use, just like if you've been able to, um, maybe when you're younger, it seems like kids always teach themselves how to do this at some point. If you can speak on a burp, like let's say you can burp the alphabet. Esophageal speech is just like that, and it's going to sound a lot like a burp. Because what a uh, Esophageal speech does is there's various ways of doing this, but you're going to inject a little bit of air down into this region in your esophagus. And just like you burp more if you swallow extra air, you can do this on purpose to initiate something like a burp and use that as a source of sound. So once the air is drawn into the esophagus, just this beginning part, there's this area called the esophageal sphincter, where this little narrowing is. It's a group of muscles that normally hold the esophagus shut unless you're taking in food or drink. Right? But that little group of muscles can be set into vibration right here. That air can be released, and as it rushes through, it can cause that area to vibrate and produces a type of phonation or type of voicing. All right, so it is possible to train yourself to use that mechanism to produce something uh, speech-like. Right, and to give you an idea, let me turn down my volume. I think this guy's pretty loud. This is what it sounds like. This is a speech pathologist. He created his own little video about esophageal speech. He taught himself how to use this type of speech and how to teach it to others. My name is... Edmund Loader. I'm a laryngectomy, phase speech pathologist, and author, publisher of the book, Self-Help for the Laryngectomy. This tape was produced to help laryngectomies produce esophageal speech. All right, I'm going to interrupt it here for a moment. You'll notice it sounds really low-pitched. Uh, because those groups of muscles that I'm just calling the esophageal sphincter for now, they're not uh, small and dainty like the vocal folds. So th after this, you're going to sound low-pitched like that, and you're only going to be able to speak in these really short groups. You'll notice he speaks only like two or three words at a time before he has to start again, and that's because without having that airflow from the lungs, we just... There's nothing to work with here. You have only those little bits of air you can inject into the esophagus, and it's not enough to ha have a nice long string of speech like we can when we're speaking on air coming from the lungs. So listen again for those two features I mentioned. It is a vocal extension on my book, and it is my wish 
I quote the book, Dead This Tape, to enable you to acquire your new voice. We you know, of course, that reading about the Savagil speech production and hearing about this technique from tape is not the ideal method for. Okay, so that's a nice sample of what it sounds like, and this link will also be on um, the Blackboard module if you care to hear more or explore some of the other things that might come up um, as well when you view a video like this. Uh, and I'm sure you'll also have more lecture, uh, questions during our lecture, so I'm happy to answer you them then. Uh, but just know this is one option for people who have had a laryngectomy, and it's not a very rare option in the U.S., but it's just one of many um, that we can go way into more detail on when you take a voice disorders class. All right, so... Um, this has been a quick lecture, so let me know what uh, I can clarify more in the lecture once you do your warm-up questions on Blackboard.